in, in this parsha, Vayeshev, we we are introduced, really, I mean, to Yosef. I mean, we, we knew about him, but now we're starting to really find a little more out about his life, how he's growing, things that are progressing. And where in, in Yosef's life do we see, we can look and stand back, and by our definition and our standards say, wow, God's really blessing this kid. Hmm. I mean, everywhere we look, there's problems, and, and there's so, something always, he's always in, in a fight with his brothers, there's always stuff going on in the family, and, and wow, God's really blessed him, huh? But then, look at the life of Yaakov. I mean, how'd that go with his brother? I, you know, we, we've, we've kind of been talking about this through the past few weeks, it's like, Yah desires for us to dwell at peace and live at peace with one another, but we're seeing example, example, example of where that really doesn't happen that often. But it doesn't mean that it can't happen. Because all these things that are written through the Scripture are written for us to learn and to have examples from so that we can take them and use them for our good, right? So the Father desires for us to be at peace and to learn how to dwell with one another and learn how to work together, but we start to see through trial, through adversity, and through all these different problems that, that happen in life, Yah takes these things and causes those who go through them to do just that, go through them and overcome. Okay. Now, if even think about this, Yisrael. I mean, why was Yaakov named Israel? Because you have wrestled, you have struggled with God and man and have prevailed right overcome well in order to say you've overcome something you have to go through something i mean think about it so in order to have that testimony of what yah is doing in our life and how he has caused us to overcome the world and the ways of it and the people i mean you kind of have to go through stuff and so we see in the lives of those who have gone before us how yah takes these things that have happened and just by outside looking in you'd be like wow this guy's got a lot of problems but when you're have a different perspective, and you're in the midst of it, and you know that God is for you, you start to see, you know, God, I don't know exactly how you're going to take these things and work them for your good, but you made a promise. See, we can rest in that. And we start to see things like, even in this Parsha, how the promise that God gave to Avraham starts to take place and starts to take shape here in the life of Yosef. And uh, he plays a pivotal part, I mean, a, a really strong role in the prophecy that was given to Abraham. So there's a lot to cover here, okay? And um, we also start to see, uh, I, I forgive the, the way I'm putting it, but the character of Moshiach ben Yosef and Moshiach ben David start to unfold here in, 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 as we go through the life of Yosef as well. And we start to see how the life of Yosef is uh, talking about restoration with Israel and how we are to be with Israel. And even, even the name Yosef. What does Yosef mean? To gather or to add. Okay, so even in his name, what do we see prophetically? That, he, that in, in him, we will learn how to gather or to add in and, bring, and start to see each other as a family. We talk about the restoration of Israel. We talk about uh, Judah and who? Ephraim, which was from who? Yosef. So again, if we go back to the beginning and we start to read the scripture from the beginning through, it really opens up a different story to us than if we're just starting in different places and pulling out different pieces and topics. And if you just start at the beginning and read it through, another story starts to unfold. And it really shows the heart of the Father. Okay? So, with all that setting it up, how did Yaakov relate to his boys? I mean... He treated them all equally, right? <laughs> we've, we've read the Parsha. We know the story, okay? Um, Yosef was a favored son, and boy, what kind of role does favoritism play? I mean, favoritism breeds contempt, right? When you show favoritism to, to one person, other, it causes others around to, uh, let's just say, not be so favorable. <laughs> And so that, that, that causes problems in the family. And the thing is, Jacob doesn't try to hide it. I always liked you best, boy, right? He doesn't try to hide it. They all know it. And so, again, we're talking about not just he was the favorite son, but then we also talk about the rejection towards the other children and even the firstborn there. I mean, Reuben, right? So there's a lot to deal with in that. But let's look for a minute as we go through this Parsha about uh, Yosef 
and his relationship with his brothers, his relationship with his father, and how that relates with us and a role of the Messiah. So we've got a lot, of, got a lot to cover today. Okay? All right, let's, let's jump into this. Genesis 37, 1 and 2. So Yaakov dwelled in the land where his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. And then these are the generations of Yaakov. So it starts to go through, and now because these are the generations of Yaakov, it starts to list all of his sons, right? No, it doesn't. These are the generations of Yaakov. Yosef. See, my point is, I want to bring out to you and show you, even in the reading of the scripture, even in the reading of, of how the narrative starts to play out, he's the favored son, okay? And, uh, and, and I think the point of that, to kind of overkill it, is he is the beloved of his father. And uh, again, this is where we're starting to draw these comparisons to, to Messiah, Okay, he is the beloved of his father. He is the one that is favored. He is the one who he's imparting promise to. He's the one, I mean, all of these things, okay? So, let's, let's go on, let's take a look. So, Yosef, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren, and the lad was with the sons of Bilhah, with the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. Then Yosef brought unto his father their evil report. Wow, you know, we could really go into their evil report and talk about slander and Lashon Hara, the evil tongue, evil speaking, and... Uh, how we shouldn't really talk bad about one another. And if somebody is talking bad about someone, we do have a responsibility to shut it down and not listen. Because we kind of have a thing, oh, someone's talking bad about somebody. Well, I didn't say anything. Yeah, but you sat there and listened to it, which is just as bad, you know? <laughs> so we're, that's kind of all we're going to go into on that because we have other, other things to get into. But the idea is they brought back an evil report to their father. Well, does it say that uh, he was wrong? Does it say that, that what he brought back was wrong? No. Did he say he, they, he made stuff up and brought it back? No. He brought back the evil report, which meant there were things that were being done that shouldn't have been done. Okay? But again, he was a talebearer. And so when we talk about the Lashon Hara and Rehelutz, the two, two things there, one is evil speaking, and the other one is talebearing. So the idea is not just what's being said, but why is it being said? Right? So Yosef was the favorite son, and he was the spy of the family. Right? He's the one that kept dad, he was telling dad what all the other kids were doing. You know? Hey, boy, go find out what your brothers are up to. I want to know what's going on over there, you know? So he was the one that got to sneak in and, 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 and trying to be incognito, right? His brothers hated him because of it. Of course, who likes being around someone who's always calling out the things that they shouldn't be doing? <laughs> that's why the prophets were stoned. <laughs> that's why Israel killed the prophets, because they were telling them of the things that they shouldn't be doing. Uh, hello, what problem did they have with Yeshua? Right? Because he showed them how they were falling short of what they thought was their righteousness. Right? Guys, you're doing things you shouldn't be doing. You need to change. Right? So what we have here is there's very prophetic things in the life of Yosef that talk about the things that are to come in Israel. Not just of Messiah himself, but Israel as well. Okay, so we're going to cover a lot of that. Now, before we go too far into it, I want to show you some uh, uh, comparisons, comparison, comparisons? Yeah, comparisons regarding Yosef and Yeshua. So we'll kind of set it up, and then we'll go back and go into a few things. But I want to make sure I get this out so that it's there seen. So I'm going to do that first, okay, before we, get, before we get too deep into some other things. All right, first, Yosef and Mashiach. He was loved by his father. Yosef was loved by his father. And I want to show you the scriptures regarding Yeshua. Okay? So he was loved by his father. Matthew 3.17 says a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved son. Right? He is hated by his brothers. John 15.8 says, If the world hates you, know that it hates me before it hated you. Right? His brothers conspire to kill him. Matthew 26.4 But says in the consulted they might take Yeshua by subtlety to kill him. Hmm. He goes to the Gentiles. Matthew 12, 18. Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved with whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit on him and he will proclaim justice to whom? The Gentiles, the nations. He's rejected by his brothers. John 1, 11 says he came to his own and his own people did not receive him. They strip off his garment, his blood-soaked garment. Matthew 27, 28. They stripped him and they put the scarlet robe on him. 
And they give him over into the hands of the Gentiles, Luke 18, 32 and 33, where he will be delivered over to the Gentiles and will be mocked and shamefully treated and spit upon. And after flogging him, they will kill him. And on the third day, he will rise. And they're surprised when he's not in the pit anymore. Right? Matthew 28, 5 and 6, the angel said to the women, do not be afraid. Why would they be afraid? <laughs> right? Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Yeshua who is crucified. He is not here. He has risen. Or said, come and see the place where he lay. So when they see him again, there, there is weeping. When they see, they thought he was to be dead, and when they see him again, there is weeping. Zechariah, Zechariah, 12.10. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy, so that when they look on me, on whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child, and weep bitterly for him as one weeps over the firstborn. And when they see him for who he is, he is sitting in glory. Colossians 3, 4 says, when Messiah, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him, where? In glory. So we start to see, you know, as we read through the story of Yosef, we see these things in the life of Yosef, but we also see these things in the life of our Messiah, Yeshua. Okay, so a lot of comparisons in there. And as we go through the story, you might see some more things that are more subtle, but these are the big things. So I'm just pointing out, the things that happen in Yosef, they're very prophetic, right? Okay. Genesis 37.3. Now, notice this. So these are the generations of Yaakov, right? And now we get to verse 3. It says, so Israel, notice the name change. Right? And, and when we're reading through the scripture, we see things like that. It says, it talks about Yaakov. It has certain things. When it talks about Israel, it has certain things. So when you see the name Israel, read, it, read what follows in the context of his name being changed to Israel and who that is. Okay? So Israel loved Yosef more than any of his other sons. Not just Jacob, Israel. So this tells us that there's a connection here with Israel and his, his, his love he has for Yosef and what's going to happen here. So because he was the son of his old age and he made him a robe of many colors. Okay, he says because he was the son of his old age, read in the Hebrew, ki ben zekunim. Because... He was the son of his old age, right? Because he had him when he was older, and we know he had another son, Benjamin, right? So why would he say why he, 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 he loved Yosef more than any of his other brothers? He still had Benjamin. Wouldn't Benjamin be the son of his old age, really, technically? Because he, I mean, he was older when he had him. So there's another thing that we can look at to say here. So zikonim can mean old ages. You know, the im at the end of a Hebrew word most of the time is masculine plural. Okay, so old ages, or it can also read uh, as having wisdom, like the word for elders. It's the same, same root word that's used here. So elders, or someone who has wisdom. So this can also read, he was the son of his wisdom. Of which sons do you think Yaakov spent most of his time with? Of which ones do you think he spent more time saying, Dad, I really want to hear what you've got to say? Yosef was there with him. And so he's gathering with So you listen to the stories. He listened to the things and he would gain from the wisdom that he has from his dad. Right? Which is what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to learn from the wisdom of the generations that are before us. But the other guys were out too busy partying and having what to do, whatever time they wanted to and doing their own thing. Yosef was with his father. Now, what's the testimony of that? What did... What did Pharaoh, you know, later, not in this parsha, but later, when Yosef is brought before Pharaoh, Pharaoh testifies of the wisdom that is with this young man. Right? So, is it as far stretched to read this scripture as, so he was the son whom he had imparted his wisdom to? Not really. And I'm not saying reading the other way is wrong. This is just another way to kind of look at it. Okay? So now he made him a robe of many colors. The Hebrew, ketunet pasim. Ketunet, it's not a jacket. It's not a coat. It's a tunic. Okay? So ketunet, like katan, like a talit katan, you know, that kind of a thing. Uh, katan, it's, it's over. So it's like a tunic right, that he made. And it could have been one that had a lot of colors, or it could have just been one that's striped, or it could have been... Uh, you know, just the standard color, but had like down on the bottom of it and around the collars have like striping and pattern design or colors around that. 
because, uh, you know, it's not like they did like really extravagant all the time, right? But the point of it is, this, this tunic that he wore was uh, set aside for specific people. I mean, someone of uh, nobility or someone like a priest would wear something like this. Because this word here for tunic, uh, pas, right, pasim, pas, uh, means uh, a long sleeved tunic. An idea of the palm or the hand or the sole of the feet. So it is a long tunic, but identifying with his hands and feet. Because there are marks around near his hands and feet. So this priest type figure, <laughs> let's, let me just put it this way. What about the birthright? Who, ends, who's, who, who do you think would end up with this birthright? Who do you think Yaakov had in mind he was going to give that to? Yosef. So the one who was the birthright has the responsibility of the family and in a manner of speaking would be a priest for that home simply because he's to look out for the welfare and the well-being of that home physically and spiritually and every other way. Okay? So here he's, he's saying that this, this is the one, right? And so Yosef has these dreams that his brothers are going to bow down to him. What do you think his brothers are going to say? Right? And not to really get into the dreams, but he has these two dreams and they're bowing down and, and his brother is like, and, and his dad, what, you think you're going to rule over us, right? I mean, even when, when, when he goes to his brothers, oh, here comes the dreamer, you know? They didn't even say, here comes Yosef or here comes, you know, oh, here he comes. No, here comes the dreamer, you know? And, and keep in mind, too, that when Yosef said the dreams to his brothers, it wasn't just a matter of, man, Guys, I had this really wild dream last night. Let me tell you about it. If you read in the Hebrew, the way that he was telling his brothers these dreams, it said, you will come here and hear these dreams I had. And it's like, uh, who you think you are? You don't talk to me like that, right? You know, here's, these, here's these, his brothers that are much older than he is, and he's 17. And like, get out of here, kid. Right? So again, you start to see this, this thing in there, and you, you really s subtly, maybe, maybe not, start to see that there's some pride in Yosef's life. Okay? Uh, maybe a little bit of entitlement. Maybe a little bit of other things. Maybe, maybe not. But nonetheless, God works some things through him. He's, he's got to bring him through a process before he could do what he wants to do with him. Okay? All right. So Yosef's katan would be an identifying mark for him. How many times did his coat get him in trouble? His brothers, Potiphar's wife. All right, how many times did his coat get him in trouble? Think about it. It's an identifying mark. So this is the covering from his father, and his brothers used it to ask Yaakov to identify him. This was the covering that was given, and uh, later his brothers take it, which after they've dipped it in blood, and say, hey, do you happen to know whose this is? <laughs> really? <laughs> Potiphar's wife held his coat to identify him. So is there an identifying mark on those who follow Yahweh? Yeah, here's one. Marks, spiritual, physical, otherwise, yeah. How about one, uh, CTO? Numbers chapter 15, 37 to 41. And you were to put them on the corners of your garment to remind you, do not follow after your eyes, but follow after the word of Yahweh. Okay, reminders in there. Ezekiel 9, 4. And, and Yahweh says to him, go through the midst of the city, go through the midst of Yerushalayim, set a mark on the foreheads of the men that sigh and cry for the abominations that are done in the midst thereof. This is not the mark of the beast. This is a mark that Yahweh is, is speaking to put on those who are godly, those who are righteous, who are crying out and, and interceding for the things they are seeing done that are not holy. If you read the rest of Ezekiel 9, what you see there is they go through, they put a mark on these men, and they start in the temple, and then they go, and uh, they go back around again and kill those who do not have the mark. And they start in the temple. Wow. Shabbat, is that a mark? Absolutely. When you keep Shabbat, it does set you apart, doesn't it? Exodus 31, 13. Speak to the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Shabbat you shall keep, for it is a what? A sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am Yahweh that sanctifies you. 
He says you keep Shabbat so that we will know that he is Yahweh who sanctifies us. It's not that we sanctify us. It's that we're doing what he is saying and he is setting us apart. Okay? Okay, Genesis 37, 4. So his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers. They hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Can you imagine? Uh, yeah, I, I would think so. But can you imagine? I mean, they couldn't even speak peaceably to him. Like every interaction with him was anger. They, couldn't, they, they could not speak peaceably to him. Talk, talk about that kind of animosity, right? And th- so this, is, this goes beyond uh, inconvenience. This is hatred. And we know hatred is equal to murder. And what do they end up doing to him? Right? Thinking they murdered him, right? 1 John 2, 9, 9-11. He that says he is in light and hates his brother is in darkness even until now. He that loves his brother abides in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and knows not whether he goes because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Again, if we love Yah, we love those whom he loves, right? So we have to learn to love one another. That means we have to learn to work together. That means we have to learn to be around each other. That means we need to learn to see each other as Yahweh sees each other, yeah, as he sees us, okay? 1 John three fourteen. So we know we have passed from death to life because what? Because we love the brothers. He that loves not his brother abides in death. Think about this. We know we have passed from death to life because we love the brothers. A lot of people say we know we passed from death to life because I love Yahweh, which we should. But Yah tells us specifically that if we truly have passed from darkness to light, we'll love the brothers. Hmm. 1 John 4.20 If a man say, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he that loves not his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God who he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God and loves who? His brother also. Okay, back to our story. Genesis 37, 13. So Israel says to Yosef, are not your brothers pasturing the flock in Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. And he says to him, here am I. Kind of interesting, he says, he tells him what he wants them to do. And then he says, here I am. It's kind of odd, don't you think? You think he would, he would holler to him and he would say, here I am, then he would tell him what he wants done. You know? Um, but here he's saying, here I'm, go- I'm going to send you to his brothers and he says, here I am. Which, in my mind, the way this is reading, it's more like an acceptance. Not just an acknowledgement of his words, but more of an acceptance of him taking on the task. I kind of get a little bit of Isaiah 6 kind of feel in this. You know, the hineni, you know, here am I, Right? So, uh, so he says, this is what I want done. And he says, okay, I'll do it, right? For verse 14. So he says to him, go now and see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock and bring me word. Uh, one more time, man, bring me word back, right? What, do you, what did you want him to do? He wanted to go see, go check on them and just see if they're okay. But what did he really want him to do? I mean, it, it, in the Hebrew, it's, it's, it's a little bit different. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron and he came to Shechem. So he says, go see the Aleph Taf Shalom Echecha of your brothers. The Aleph Taf Shalom. Now what do we know about this Aleph Taf? When we see the Aleph Taf like this, it, it's got something to do with the Messiah. Something to do with revealing him or how he is. So we find the Aleph Taf Shalom of your brothers. And the Aleph Taf Shalom the flock. Hatzon. So the shalom of your brothers and the shalom of, your, of the flock. Which is more than, how is it? How are you? Because we know shalom means to be made whole, to be complete, right? So he says, go check on the completeness or wholeness of your brothers and the flock. Notice the concern was not just for the brothers, but the flock as well. He's a shepherd, right? And what, how would this relate to Yeshua in us? Because when he came, he came to check on our shalom, to make us whole, to make us complete. Not just us, but for the flock that was not in the fold as well. Yeshua says, I've come for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He also said, there are other sheep that I have that are not in this fold, that are not in this pen. So he came to check on the shalom of his brothers and the tribe of Jehuda and those that are not in the fold, right? And so he sent him from the valley of Hebron. This is really interesting, okay? Because he says, uh, Okay, 
So, and he sent him, the word shalach, and he sent him, me'emech. Me'emech. We'll come back to that in a minute. That's, that's an interesting phrase that's used here. But uh, from the valley of Hebron, or from the depth of Hebron. So what would we consider down at the depth of Hebron? How about the cave of Machpelah? Where, who was buried there? Sarah, Avraham. Right, that's where the matriarchs and patriarchs were to be buried. The cave that Abraham purchased. Okay? Now the word Machpelah means to fold together. So again, we have a picture of Yosef, one who means to add. He's being sent from the depths to his brothers, and again, folding together. So the idea is, is being folded together or bringing in something here, okay? And again, just kind of keep these things in mind. They'll all come together. From the valley of Hebron. Interesting thing is, Hebron is not a valley. That's why I said that's, that's kind of interesting the way it puts it that way, you know? Uh, Rashi notes that Hebron is on a mountain. So how can one be sent from its depths? The word translated as valley can also mean a mystery. So he sent it from the depths or a mis- the mystery from Hebron out to his brothers. So a mystery of Hebron. What would be the mystery of Hebron? Well, Hebron means what? To be folded together, joined in, right? Right? Hebron means seat of association from the word havar which means to join together, have fellowship with, or to join with. So he sent Yosef out from the mystery of joining together to go see his brothers in the flock. You start to see some things that are prophetic? That's that's Yeshua, and that's the gathering in together of all Israel. Right? Ezekiel 37, 16. Moreover, son of man, take one stick and write on it for Yehuda and for the children of Israel, his companions. Now notice, this is what it says in the Hebrew. To Yehuda and the sons of Israel, Havarav, joined with him. Again, this is this word, Haver. Haver, the joining with, joining to. Same thing we've talked about in, in Hebron, right? Joining with or joining to. And then take another and write on it for Yosef, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel, his companions. And in the Hebrew reads, for, the, for all the house of Israel and those joined with him. So again, there's this picture of joining with to bring back together as one. See, I mean, it's one thing to say this, this, this portion is very prophetic, but when you start to really look into it, it really starts to unfold, doesn't it? So the question is, who are we joining ourselves to? You know, daily in, in, in our life and the things that we're doing, who are we joining ourselves to? Psalm 119.63 says, I am a companion of all them that fear thee and of all them that keep thy precepts. Proverbs 28.24, Whoso robs his father or his mother and says it is no transgression, the same as a companion of a destroyer. Ecclesiastes 4.9 and 10, Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. This word, havaro, the same word we've been talking about, haver. Okay? So if someone falls, those that, the one that is joined with him will lift him up. But woe to him that he, when it is alone when he falls, for he has not another to lift him up. It's like when we, if we will isolate ourselves and, and we pull ourselves away from everyone, when we fall, who's there to help catch us? And he came to a place called what? Shechem. Shechem. So they came to Shechem, which was the, the shoulders, a place of a burden, the valley of decision, a place where covenant will be established, a place where Yahweh says, when you go into the land I'm giving you, you are to set the covenant in place there. So this is a place where they were supposed to be shepherding the flock. The flock is supposed to keep in front of them continually the idea of life and death, blessing and cursing. I've set before you what? Choose. So, so we have the word constantly set before us so that we have plainly the choices that we are supposed to make. Okay? If we're uh, living life in light of what the Scripture is telling us to do, these are our choices. Okay? Loose paraphrase of events so far. Okay? So you've been with me so far. This is kind of a recap of what I've been saying. All right? On behalf of the Father, Yosef, or one who gathers, is sent to his brothers. He first is given the recognition of being a priest in their midst by the marks near his hands and his feet. 
and is acknowledged as being one who's received his father's wisdom. He is sent to experience the shalom of his brothers and to check on the shalom of the flock, to remind the brothers of their obligation to keep the sheep in the place of Shechem before the covenant. Prophetic? Now, how do you think the brothers respond to this? Genesis 37, 18. So when they saw him afar off, even before he came near to them, they conspired against him to slay him. And they said one to another, Behold, the dreamer comes. Come now, therefore, let us slay him and cast him into the pit. And we will say some evil beast has devoured him, and we shall see what has become of his dreams. Oh, here he comes. Let's just get it over with. Let's just kill him and throw him in the pit. And then we'll see if his dreams come true. We'll see if his dreams live if we kill him. Hmm. Kind of sounds like Yeshua when he says, if you kill this temple or destroy this temple in three days, right? And Judah says to his brothers, What profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites. Let them kill him. In a manner of speaking, it's kind of what he was saying. He didn't expect them to really live. Okay? So let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and let not our hand be on him because he's our brother, our flesh. We can't kill him. Let's let somebody else do it for us. Right? Sounds like the mob, doesn't it? <laughs> and his brothers were content at this. His brothers were happy to hear this. All right? Verse 28. And then they passed, the, uh, passed by Midianite merchantmen. <laughs> How convenient, right? And they drew and lifted up Yosef out of the pit. They lifted him up out and handed him over. And uh, they said to, so they sold Yosef to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And they brought Yosef to Egypt. They sold him for silver, 20 pieces, which was the price of a young slave at the time. Which interestingly enough, um, from what I could gather, was also the price for each of them, each of the brothers. How many was there? How many brothers did he have that was out there? 10. Okay. Because Benjamin was right so 10 right so they each got two pieces of silver for selling their brother which would have been about the price for a really nice pair of shoes they sold them out for a pair of nikes Thirty-seven twenty-six, and judah said to his brothers what profit is it if we slay olive Taf, our brother now, see, this is what I'm showing you. See, what was about the, about the Aleph Toph? What was the deal? Something with the Messiah, right? So what, what good is it if we slay Aleph Toph, our brother, conceal Aleph Toph, his blood? And then they passed by, so they lifted up Aleph Toph, Yosef, out of the pit and sold Aleph Toph, Yosef, to the Ishmaelites, and they brought Aleph Toph, Yosef, to Egypt. A lot in there, isn't there? All right. So Yehuda said to sell Yosef. Here's something interesting. Matthew 27, 3. When Yehuda, wait, I thought his name was Judas. His Hebrew name was Yehuda, which was Judah. Okay? Yeah, his, uh, his other, uh, the Greek name, how he would be known in Greek in a Greek community would be Judas. Okay? So Yehuda is the one who betrayed him and said, let's sell him. Much like it was with Yosef. His brother Yehuda said, let's sell him. So now Reuven comes back. He returns, which kind of makes, where did he go? Right? Nonetheless, he comes back and it says, Reuven returned to the cistern and upon hearing Yosef, upon seeing Yosef was not in it, he tore his clothes in mourning. So it says he tore his clothes. The word there for clothes is beged and beged is a, an outer garment. Okay? So he tore his clothes in mourning. Now, what do they do now? They go back, they take the, uh, the, 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 the tunic, and they dipped in uh, the goat's blood, which makes me think of like, okay, where do we see uh, the, the, the blood of goats, rams being used? And scripturally speaking, how about like Yom Kippur, right? Picture of Messiah, picture of, okay. So he, they take it back to their father, Yaakov, and, and what does he do? He tears his garment, but it's not the same word for garment, because he tears simla, which is an inner garment. I'm not going to show you what that is. <laughs> and you say, thank you. <laughs> okay. 
So, but but my, I, my, my point here is that when Raven saw it, he tore his garment. He was upset. No, but when his father heard it, he laid himself bare. He was rent down to the, down to the core of who he was. His brother was upset, but... See the difference? Matthew 27, 51. At the moment, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rock split apart. The garment covering the innermost part of the temple where the presence of the Father was, was rent. The Father was rending his covering when his son, when, he, when the news of his son dying. So his brothers say, let's throw him in the pit. So they conspire to kill him. They decide not to do it themselves. Let's let the blood be on somebody else's hands. They sell him for silver. They take the garment and the goat blood. They take it to the father, ask him to identify the garment, right? Like Yeshua's blood-stained garment, right? So Yosef is sold into slavery, but we learn Yah will use this, right? Genesis 37, 28. So the Midianite traders passed by. They drew up Yosef. They sold him, right? Genesis 15, 13 and 14. And he said to Avram, his name hadn't been changed yet, right? Know of a surety that your seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs and shall serve them, and it shall afflict them 400 years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterward they shall come out with great substance. Check this out. The beginning of this prophecy really starting to take shape is Yosef going down into bondage. Because he says that your offspring will serve, they will be in bondage, they will do this. The first one to go forward to, to start the ball rolling, so to speak, is Yosef. So again, this is really a lot that's happening here. Okay? He's falsely accused. He goes and, and Potiphar puts him in a position of authority, right? And Potiphar learns to trust him in his household. Potiphar's wife? What happens? She falsely accuses him of what she was trying to do to him. Hashtag Joseph too, you know? Run, Joseph, right? Get out of there, man. 1 Corinthians 6.18 says, Flee fornication. Every sin a man does is without the body, but he that commits fornication sins against his own body. All right? So again, he was identified by his garment. Wow. One more time, identified by his garment. And then he got him in trouble again. And he, so he got thrown in prison. Now here's the thing. He could have lost his head over this but he was thrown into the king's prison not to not let's say it was club fed okay <laughs> but it was not like the, the 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 big prisons right not the harsh 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 you know this was uh more like the white collar criminals <laughs> okay <laughs> so but, and, and and even in here yosef was given a place of authority all right we'll come we'll come back to this so Yosef in prison, what he was accused of could have caused him a death sentence, but he was put in the king's prison. Again, he was blessed in prison and given authority in prison. So why is he succeeding when most others would quit? God, I don't understand what's going on. I mean, every time I try to do what I know is right, and every time I try to do what you told me to do, I end up in a worse situation. What are you doing? I don't, I don't get it. I've, I've had it. I'm done. Every time I take a step forward, you, you cut me down. Do we ever see anything like that coming from Yosef's mouth? Nope, not once. Not once. It's like even though all these things were happening, you, I mean, you can't help. I mean, he had to have wondered what was going on, but he didn't. Mm -mm. You think maybe God was trying to teach Yosef to keep this thing shut? Genesis 39, 21. But Adonai was, was, was with Yosef Showing him grace and giving him favor, that's mercy. Showing him grace and giving him favor, giving him mercy in the sight of the prison warden. Even in prison, he, God extended his grace and his mercy to him in prison. And the prison warden made Yosef supervisor of all the prisoners in the prison so that whatever they did there, he was in charge of it. And the prison warden paid no attention to anything Yosef did because Adonai was with him and whatever he did, Adonai prospered in prison. <laughs> All right. So what happens with next? He comes across two guys, a cupbearer and a baker. And they both look disturbed. 
Well, they're in prison. They would look disturbed, <laughs> right? But he said, it, it was so much so that he, he asked them, guys, what's going on today? What, what's, what's with the looks? What's happening? And they tell him, well, we had these dreams, and there's no one to tell us what's going on. So what happens here? So even in, in prison, Yahweh is arranging circumstances to complete his will. He had the dreams. Now, here's the thing. Yosef has learned a thing or two. As far as this dream thing goes, yeah. yeah. Did he tell his dreams to Potiphar? Did, did he tell his dreams to the warden? Did he tell his dreams to Pharaoh? Who else did he tell his dreams to? <laughs> no one. No one. He's learned some humility. He didn't come in. Well, God said, y'all are going to bow down to me. Yeah, that would have went well as he was being sold to, to, to Potiphar. And, right? Yeah, that's not going to fly. He, God was teaching him humility. Okay? And sometimes, you know, so, humility is a hard one to, to, to be taught because you don't just have it. You have to be taught it. And the best way to teach humility is you got to get knocked down. <laughs> the, the pride has, has to be removed, you know? So, but he learns some things. He learns that I don't interpret dreams. I don't take these dreams and I don't make these dreams say what I want to make them say. I don't do that. Okay, he's learned this. Okay, Genesis 40, verse 8. So they said to him, we've dreamed a dream and there's no interpreter of it. And Yosef said to them, do not interpretations belong to God. Aha. So tell me, and uh, maybe... God will tell us what it is, right? All right. So the interpretations of the dreams were what? The cupbearer would be reinstated in three days. The cupbearer. What did the cupbearer do? The wine. The blood. Life. Being given, right? So he, so he says that the cupbearer would be reinstated. And, and so the baker, after hearing it was a favorable dream, goes, hey, yeah, I had a dream. Yeah, here, this was my dream. Am I going to get reinstated too? Because you, oh no, you're going to die. <laughs> wow. Wow. But it, it's like the cupbearer was there and he, he was told the dream and the baker just wanted to write off of what somebody else was saying. You know? Because it wasn't until he heard what that was when he, he opened up and he said, oh, hey, yeah, I, I, I'd like some of that. <laughs> So what happens next? Again, be careful trying to read your own interpretations into dreams, words, and Scripture. 2 Peter 1.20, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture of, is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Ruach HaKodesh. 1 Corinthians 13.12, now we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror, but then we will see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete, but then I will know everything completely just as God now knows me completely. Okay? Be careful trying to read your own interpretations into things. Because see, we have an idea of we try to make things say what we want them to say. You know? And, and, and maybe there's someone with a little bit of wisdom who is impartial who may have a different take of what's really being said here. You know? We got too much invested in it sometimes. You know? All right. Yosef said, do not interpretations belong to whom? Ya Yahweh, belong to God. So this word interpretations is petron. Petron. The total times, in, in like in the King James, this word petron is used as six times. Five times it's as given as interpretation. And once it's given as interpretations. The interesting thing is it only occurs six times, but every single time is in relationship to Yosef. So this word to interpret or to open up and reveal something is given in relationship to Yosef. Again, we see a picture of, of the Messiah here. Because who is the one who opens up and interprets what has been given? Interpret is patar, which means to open up or to interpret. Now look at this. Luke 24, 13-16. Behold, two of them went the same day to about a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem, about three score furlongs, and they talked together of all the things which happened. And it came to pass, while they communed together in reason, Yeshua himself drew near, and they went with them, but their eyes were holding that they should not know him. So they're talking about all these things that are going on in Jerusalem, and Yeshua appears to them, he starts walking with them, he says, guys, what's going on? Right? 
And they're like, who are you and why do you not know? Right? And so how does he respond? What happens here? Luke 24, 27, he, he starts to explain to them about what really happened that they didn't get. Yeah, this is what you saw, but this is what really happened. Okay? And he started to open up and reveal things to them. And it says, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them. The, re, this would be related to that word, Petron. He opened up and explained and expounded to them all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. So he was, he was opening up and revealing the Messiah to them, starting with Moses and the prophets, and explaining the work of the Messiah, what the Messiah would come to do, what would have to happen, how he would lay his life down, how he would overcome all these things. Then when he took the bread, he made the blessing, and he broke it, their eyes were opened. And they saw him for who he was. And then he disappeared. Could you imagine? 2430, and it came to pass as he sat at me with them, he took the bread and blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to them. And their eyes were open. Who opens the eyes of the blind? Yeshua. Yahweh is the only one who can open the eyes of the blind. He is the only one that can open up, reveal, and to show what is, what, what is intended with his heart and with the scriptures. Yeshua opened up their eyes. They could see, but they couldn't see. Their eyes were open, and they knew him, and then he vanished out of their sight. And they said one to another, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us by the way, and while he what? Opened to us the Scriptures. When we start to read through the Scriptures, and we, we, when we understand the Scripture is from the very beginning, Bereshit Aleph, you know? Bereshit Barah Elohim, right? The very first, all the way through. We start to see the story unfold before us. And then we start to see our role in that. It goes a lot deeper than we think. And all these things that happened back then are not just stories, guys. These are things that are revealing the heart of Yah for His people and revealing the work that He is establishing in our midst. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let it be. Amen.